try it out the front door every time. Okay, well today we have our own uh, Meg Conkey speaking today. It's going to be wonderful. She's, of course, you, uh, many of you know her work on many, many fronts, uh, but one of them is on up the Upper Paleolithic, and she's been working there her whole career, I right. think we could safely <laughs> say. Um, and <clears throat> so, I'm guessing we're going to hear a lot about her, the current work going on, as well as um, things linking to all the other aspects that she is so knowledgeable about. Um, and the title is Catching Up with the Upper Paleolithic, Art, Memory, and Social Lives. So it plans to be a terrific presentation, so please Thanks, welcome Christine. Meg. Thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it's always great to have somebody make you start making sense of what you've been doing by having to put something together. So <clears throat> today I'm just going to talk here a little bit about some of the things I did this summer, but also a little bit of a perspective on some of the many issues and interesting research that's going on, um, having to do with the Upper Paleolithic, but also having to do a lot of it with pigments and ochre and color um, that have been um, in the news lately for all sorts of reasons. So um, we'll get uh, started here. And I did want to start out by dedicating this talk to a recently deceased colleague. Um, Professor Erika Engelstadt from the University of Tromsø, Norway. She and her husband, Knut Helskog, also an archaeologist, were here as visiting faculty members in the 1990s. And um, it's an unfortunate loss um, and just part of our, our wider community. And I just draw your attention. If you're um, a first year graduate student taking 229A, I really uh, um, stress that you try to read her critique of post processual archaeology for its absolute ignorance, if not dismissal, of feminist theory in post-processual archaeology. And more recently, uh, again, talking about uh, things that are much more than gender and a special issue of the archaeological uh, Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory. And again, just to play some of the issues that she addresses in context, which are involved many of us here, <clears throat> is that she was part of a Move, the first movement about uh, issues about gender and feminism in archaeology in Norway in the mid-1980s, uh, where they started publishing this wonderful journal, which in Norwegian, it says women in Norwegian archaeology, or women in archaeology in Norway, but it spells out K-A-N, which means we can. So uh, it's, it's really quite good. And then another really important edited volume on challenging situatedness, gender, culture, and the production of knowledge. So I'd just like to dedicate that to our former colleague who we lost. So today I'm going to mention a little bit of work in Paleolithic archaeology that's either controversial and or bears on our own research project in uh, southern France. Um, and because it's a little bit about what I did this summer, but it's also what I did this summer had to do with some of the things that we're working on. I went to two different conferences, one in Tübingen, Germany, and the other in Paris. Um, and that both sort of are trying to push on our understandings of what we call Paleolithic art and then just bring you all up to date, as Christine asked me to do, uh, a little bit on our research project in southern France, um, which is a early middle Magdalenian open air site in the pre-Pyrenees of the southern France, especially some of the work doing with colorants, but some other aspects as well. So first, I don't know, do I need to remind you about the Upper Paleolithic or the Paleolithic? There's the middle, there's the upper, there's, <laughs> there's the um, Mousterian, the Chateauperonian, the Ornation, the Gravettian, the Salutrian, and the Magdalenian, and you can see our site. Uh, we've just sort of placed it right here in the middle of the middle Magdalenian. And I don't know if I need to remind you about what Paleolithic art is, um, but uh, if anybody doesn't know about painted caves or the hundreds and thousands of artifacts and art objects and statuettes and other kinds of things, I'd be happy to provide a little overview at some point about what we know and what we don't know. Um, and since we have been donated a set of casts of some of the portable art by Olga Sofer from the University of Illinois, and we're about to put this back in the display case, but it's out now, so I just thought if anybody wanted to see some of the casts of some of these different um, objects, um, that it's there to look at um, afterwards. Okay, so one of the really exciting things that's going on is that 
There seems to be uh, a rush of all kinds of interesting new evidence from uh, parts of Africa, especially about the uses of color and sort of material objects that are many of which are dated much earlier than we ever imagined. So, and some of it is very much involved with <clears throat> people wanting to say this is the earliest this, this is the origins of that, and it's something that I have been concerned about for many years. In 1991 with Sarah Williams, I wrote an article called Original and Narratives, the Political Economy of Gender in Archaeology, <clears throat> but we also talked about how origins research um, is really very uh, crucial to what a lot of people do, especially in the Paleolithic. And so you see articles in recent issues of science which say complex behavior arose at the dawn of humans, advanced stone tools, pigment, and extensive networks emerged as an environment changed. Then from a very important site dating to about 300,000 years ago in East Africa, Oligar Sile, uh, all sorts of evidence of pigment. They're tracing the sources of the pigment but quite widely. So some of the kinds of things that people have claimed for much later times, many people are finding much earlier times, but of course they're also making big claims about what these are all about. So it's not just the evidence, but it's what we do with the evidence, or as David Hurst Thomas used to say, it's not what you find, it's what you find out. And it's the words you use and the way you present it, uh, which is all part of some of our more um, sort of reflexive and uh, ideas about how to do archaeology. Now, in case you missed it, I've got a couple of ICYMs. Um, in case you missed it, uh, there is now well-documented interbreeding between Neanderthals and modern humans. And according to 23andMe, to which I submitted my own uh, saliva sample, I personally have 306 Neanderthal variants which is more than 88% of the people that 23andMe have tested, um, but it's still less than 4% of my overall DNA. But that's okay, I like having Neanderthal. I've always been a big fan. They would not have made it as long as they did if they weren't great and adapted and doing all the right thing. Um, and then even more exciting, I found out that my mother's haplogroup left the Middle East uh, for Europe about 26,000 years ago, or just as the Upper Paleolithic was getting into full swing. So um, it's definitely exciting. So the other, in case you missed it, is that there has been a new species or a subspecies identified from a cave in the um, central uh, Caucasus Mountains up here, uh, the Denisova Cave, and exactly what it's going to be called or whatever, it is from a tiny finger bone and they've got some teeth and some other things that they've been able to extract DNA from. And then furthermore, we now know, just recently reported this week or this month, is that, and I don't know why you would want to use the word tryst, <laughs> um, but that again, that's part of the sensationalism that one has to garner, I guess. Um, but there is now an interbreeding between Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans. So, uh, really quite interesting kinds of uh, connections, which if you look at this recent chart about how much interbreeding has been going on, the implications for archaeology is that we have for so long said Mousterians or Neanderthals made these kinds of tools, modern people made these kinds of tools, but what happens if you start getting them oh, are, there ha are they three quarters Neanderthal and therefore they're not making these tools or are they whatever? So I think it really has a lot of implications for the tendency for us to try to sort of identify a particular group, in this case of hominins, to particular technologies, to, to particular uh, groups of material culture. And also, of course, um, it also sort of impacts the assessment Oh, it's only modern humans that have these kind of cognitive um, attributes and only Neanderthals that have these, but if we've got interbreeding and so forth, this is going to lead to some very interesting reassessments and reevaluations of these uh, attributes that we think are important in understanding human cultural evolution. So the, more, the latest big controversy, of which I have to say I'm a part of, was that science decided that a major um, article would, should be published about the so-called first artists being Neanderthals because of some dating techniques, uranium thorium dating techniques, um, on these skins of calcite that form on cave walls. 
uh, could demonstrate that these artists, and you can see what their artwork was, a little red this is and that, here and there, um, and dated to 60,000 years ago or more, and so these must have been made by Neanderthals. Well, not everybody agrees. There was a paper published just uh, recently um, by some people who are very central to the whole use of that technique, especially Maxime Aubert um, in the Journal of Human Evolution, showing why some of those dates may be wrong. <clears throat> I'm part of a group, and if you can believe this, a group of 44 of us who have co-authored a paper, uh, <clears throat> again, challenging the use of this met particular methodology. Not that we don't believe Neanderthals might <clears throat> be able to have the ca capability <clears throat> of doing things like that, but that actually there's a lot of methodological problems with the uranium thorium <clears throat> dating technique on these, on these caves. So, uh, and then of course, one of the things that um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, authors here, Aubert and others, have argued is that there may be red on the, some of these walls, but it's not yet demonstrated that it's either a pigment or a paint, and that it might actually be part of the natural production of uh, colored, what is uh, to us colored material in the cave wall. And they also um, have serious concerns about the methodology as well. So <clears throat> that's one of the big uh, controversies swirling along out there. And of course, it raises really interesting anthropological question what constitutes art, um, and then just today, uh, this particular article in uh, Nature, a letter in Nature, claiming for, they have an abstract drawing from a site at 70,000 years old in Blombos Cave in South Africa. They claim that it's a drawing. Uh, well, they call it a drawing, and they say that it was done with an ochre crayon. Well, uh, it was done with a piece of ochre, but whether it's a crayon also leads you to think that it was a drawing, right? So the way in which we use words tends to lead to certain interpretation. And if you want to see what I have to say about it, uh, it was just posted today from uh, National Geographic. I had a big interview with them uh, about that, and there's a, um, you can just look it up on National Geographic today. Um, anyway, so those are some of the kind of fun things and they feed into one of the first conferences that I went to this summer, uh, which was in uh, Tübingen, Germany, in the southwestern part of Germany. And the title was Images, Gestures, Voices, Lives, What Can We Learn from Paleolithic Art? Now, this was a really interesting conference. It had a lot of different voices, philosophers, art historians, archaeologists, ethnographers, uh, many people that I hadn't really known about much before, but everybody had some interesting perspectives. But of course, it was not just uh, by chance that they decided to have this conference in this area, because it definitely was, if you will, reinscribing the centrality of this part of the Europe for some very early um, art forms, especially from a series of sites uh, in the Swabian Jura. And you'll have to talk to Tim Gill, because he's uh, the only one in the room who's excavated at any of these sites unless somebody else has done so, and I don't know about it. But here we are in the uh, southwestern part of, um, of Germany, and um, uh, where's my little thing here? All right. hmm. Okay, so there's a series of sites in these two different river valleys um, bracing off the, off the Danube here, as you can see. And they've yielded all sorts of amazing materials, uh, statuettes, and things made out of ivory uh, from some of them. And the Tübingen team has been working there for, for many years. So it's probably natural that not only did they host this conference, but they also had a lot of contributions to it. Now, um, whoops, going backwards here. So the main question was to critically engage with foundational interpretive frameworks, concepts, and ideas. And these are all the kinds of things that came up as sort of sections. You know, what is the relationship between modern cognition, homo sapiens sapiens, and art? Uh, soundscapes, you know, what is going on in some of these places that's not just the material culture? Uh, People talking about what is ochre and the things that it's used for, new ways to use ethnoarchaeology. What can we learn from our fascination with Paleolithic art? Um, the more than human context that one has to include, not just the images, but the caves and animals. And of course, something that I was particularly interested in was how to understand Paleolithic art as material culture, as meaningful practice. Uh, very good papers on apprenticeship, uh, materiality, and my own presentation was a little bit on uh, memory. 
And I drew from the framework offered by Barbara uh, Mills and uh, Walker on memory work in 2008. And I tried to show the way in which some of the Paleolithic art can be understood uh, and some of the terms that are used in memory work. In other words, uh, there are these incredible array of depositions, bones stuck in cracks in one cave in uh, south, far southwestern France. There are only 300 objects that were stuck in caves or cracks oftentimes around the materials. And this engraving that's going on in this picture here, there's very interesting uh, uh, depositions on both sides. One of the local raw material, the other uh, uh, exotic raw material. Um, and then, of course, uh, certainly, uh, there's many things that are crossed out. There are images that are accumulated, adding things over and over. And of course, there's a lot of embodied practices as are suggested by some of these photographs. And the whole idea is that, you know, leading from some of these memory making possibilities uh, is that these are parameters on who a maker, a viewer, and thus who a knower uh, could be. So that was, uh, that whole conference is of course, they want us all to publish it. But. Then the other one I went to was the, universe, the, the Institute or the uh, Association of the Pre and Proto Historic Sciences. It's the International Union of Pre and Pre Proto Historic Sciences, or UISPP. And again, for those of you interested in the history of archaeology, if you don't know anything about it, you might want to go back to when the World Archaeological Congress was formed in reaction and rejection to the way in which the UISPP was working in 1986. And then there was quite a story written about it by Peter Ucko. So that's just a piece of history. But the particular session I was in there, and it was the most disorganized conference I have ever been to in my entire life. You could not find who was giving a paper, at what time, in what room, or anywhere. It was just impossible. So fortunately, we had a lot of really good people in our session, and we you know, hung out, we went to lunch, and. We just couldn't, and it bumped into people, but we just had no idea. What, and I'll, someday I could show you the organizational chart of it, which was even more chaotic. Anyway, we're in Paris, so who cares? Um, and it was a good session. And um, I think that, and it was organized by uh, actually two Spaniards, one who teaches at, uh, in Newfoundland, both of whom have been here. Oscar was here as a postdoc. Uh, again in the 90s, and of course Manolo Gonzalez Morales was also here uh, for several years with his uh, wife in the, in the 90s. And I think that what we came to was best summed up by John Robb from Cambridge, a paper which he called it formerly art, and instead focus on powerful objects, social technologies, and material culture. So I think he really summed up a lot of the directions that pe people went. However, um, Sylvia Tomashkova, one of our former PhDs, thinks that the term art, however, is what she calls a useful transfer station, and that it, has, it can discursively generate, uh, leading to other issues and practices if you don't just end up thinking about it as art, but what does it lead to? And for her, with the work she's doing now in South Africa with petroglyphs is whatever they were intended to be, they're markers of effort, skill, technological knowledge, and a measure of time. So I think she's using it and says, let's not, we probably can't get rid of it. It sort of gets us into, into a discussion. So let's use it to go further and to move on. Um, all the papers from this session are already signed up for a special issue of the Journal of Anthropological Method and Theory. So we all have some work to do. <laughs> right. My paper <clears throat> was, um, and all of us were sort of really trying to see how um, some of these terms have predisposed us to certain ways of doing research and to certain kinds of interpretations. And what do we miss if we call them images? What do we miss when we call it visual culture? Um, and, and the whole idea is, is this debate we have over art a distraction or is it useful itself? Are we kind of mind trapped? Um, what I tried to do was to, um, and I got a lot of really nice feedback about this, was that we assume that much of these images, many of these images have a certain functions, that they function socially, they function symbolically, and they function really technologically in some sort of ways. But I really was trying to challenge those functionalities because everybody, when you think that it functions as a symbol or as a t technology or whatever, you think that it's all intentional. And so 
the intentionality has to be questioned. Um, and so I went back to Lévi-Strauss, 1966, and tried to reclaim the notion of bricolage, which is sort of putting things together as you can with whatever's available, and the bricoleur, who's the person who's doing this, and uh, made a good argument for how I think, in some senses, uh, this is going to work for many of the kinds of things we think is Paleolithic art, that it may not be as intentional towards art and all of these other big things as we think they are, but they actually are taking advantage of where they are, what materials they have, what the shape of the cave wall is, uh, and what sort of things um, are there. So anyway, as you know, I'm very big about theory. Theory opens up your mind. Oh. <clears throat> then, uh, yes, you ever pick up a rock and then forget why? <laughs> it could be the case. Okay, now in the last part here, I'm going to talk a little bit about our site and the work that we've been doing. Uh, the site is uh, called Père Blanc. It's in the Ariège department in France, and this year we just had a study season with a wonderfully, marvelously small crew. No hordes of people to feed or house or deal with their personal problems or any of that sort of stuff. And um, doing it with my uh, colleagues uh, that I've been working with for some time, Kathleen Sterling, um, now an associate professor at uh, Binghamton University, also a Berkeley PhD, and Sebastian Lacombe, also uh, in France at uh, the National Research Center in Toulouse, as well as at Binghamton University. Uh, Pat, uh, Patrice Bonafou, who's actually a Maya specialist, but who's been working with us for about 15 years. Uh, then Joelle Nivens, who's a, a, a PhD candidate. She's going to file by November. <laughs> at NYU, and then a graduate student, also a PhD candidate, Nathan Klimbara at, at Binghamton University. So it was a good, small, compatible, focused group, which you actually get things done, which is great. Now, Père Blanc as a site is located in the very way south of France. Here we are, down here in the foothills of Pyrenees. And in the region, the site is about here along this path that goes through the woods. Um, in a today wooded environment, maybe not the place you would expect to find an open air site, uh, but of course in the Pleistocene there were no trees, right? So it was not a. Um, all right, did I lose somebody? Yes, I lost the arc. Here we go. Can you still get me, Arf, wherever you are? Do you still have me? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and what, of course, what you can see here is there's a lot of open fields, which we had been working in since 1993, doing a regional survey. And so for us to end up finding the, the best possible site in the wood uh, is pretty um, ironic. Now, we never would have been able to find that without the pioneering work of none other than the Paleolithic archaeologist known as Kent Lightfoot, <laughs> who visited us. And he was down here in this cornfield, so close, <laughs> but not quite. I think I detected it. I get no credit. Right? And, well, here you are. Like, what the hell's going on? Yeah, can you, right, you want to put, which, which mic is it? This mic, you want it underneath? <laughs> Does that work? Uh, okay, I keep getting thumbs up from back there. But anyway, so thank you, Kent, for your dedicated work with our augers, uh, samples there in that wonderful little cornfield which probably has stuff in it because it came down the hill, right? I found it. <laughs> yeah, you did, right? <laughs> so we have been um, working there. And this is what the view is like once you get out of the woods a little bit. You can see the whole ridge line uh, the, of the Pyrenean chain of mountains right there, and of course, some of the rolling hills. The site itself was located on this path that goes along the top of the ridge. And these are some of our. Uh, structures covering our excavation units, but it gives you a sense of being in a wooded environment. Of course, there's many challenges to that. Fortunately, the landowners have been really great about it and say that we can cut down anything except for the oaks. So we've been doing a lot of forestry, 
and, uh, and uh, brush whacking and so on and so forth. It makes it especially hard for the uh, laser transit, the EDM there, to shoot things when you've got trees in the way. People are sometimes holding trees back like this while they can shoot it through and then letting them go, boing, right? Anyway, so we've done eight years of excavations, and so we decided that in 2018 we really needed a study season because, of course, everything, well, you all know this, it's time to stop. Monday, we're leaving on Saturday, we're excavating. Monday, no, we gotta keep going, we might find something. Tuesday, we're still excavating. Wednesday, we're still excavating. Thursday, okay, pack it up, get it into the storage area, and leave, right? Yeah, it's in France. We can't work with it like some of you who work here. So now the idea is that, of course, everything is stored by year. But that doesn't make much sense to know what's coming out of a site that may be going for, you know, like 100 meters. So um, what do you do? So you go in and you take everything out and you start putting everything back together with its unit rather than with its year. So by year within the unit. So that's what we did this summer, got everything out, thousands, tens of thousands of artifacts. Um, and uh, just worked, worked away on it. Of course, the most spectacular thing is this so-called structure that we've been excavating uh, for a number of different years, about 10 meters uh, wide. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about that today because you all can just read our article about it, right? <laughs> Soon to appear in current anthropology. Um, and so I'll mention a few things about the structure, but it's really very interesting because it's not really got any parallels anywhere else that we know of. Uh, there are definitely little working areas, such as here, here, um, and whether, we're trying to figure out exactly what it is, what it looked like. This part is very different. The hypothesis, one hypothesis still is that it might be a burial um, because it's covered in a tumulus sort of way with these different kind of sandstone slabs. And then this was sort of more of a working area uh, that was possibly backed up against uh, the, the path and the top of the ridge is right behind it. So I'm gonna get Lisa and me out of there for a minute to show you this exposure here of er eroded bedrock. And the path is right, uh, right about here. So was something like this structured and built up against exposed bedrock? That's one of our problems, and I'll mention a little bit about what we're doing about that. So the excavated area covers about 80 square meters, um, more or less, probably a little more now. We've got three different sectors, um, the structure in the far east, a uh, central section where we started the excavations, and then the western sector, which is after this summer's work, we are thinking a little bit more about how important this area was. It seems as if all of the exotic flints uh, almost all coming from the West, uh, all started out here and then find themselves in different shapes and forms redistributed throughout, especially over in the structure. So there seems to be a real connection there. So although we'd really like to just finish the excavation of the structure, we think we also have to do a little bit more in the Western sector um, as well. Um, and then the question is, what did the landscape look like when the Magdalenians arrived? So here we see our um, eroded bedrock that's at the top of the structure. Here is the path. And here is the ever vigilant, ever active geologist, Bill Dietrich from the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences here. And his idea was, let's see if there's any bedrock over here underneath the soil. And he started pulling out of all of these pieces and has submitted samples for what's called cosmogenic nuclide analysis, which what is involved in that is that when these rocks were exposed, cosmic rays, well, they hit everything. So cosmic rays are hitting, and they have certain isotopes that they influence. And you actually can, from the rate that you're getting of the, of the isotope, in this case, we're looking at BE10, uh, is actually, can give you a rate at which the soil was covering or the soil production rate. So we can guess, we can evaluate or estimate the last time that these uh, rocks were actually exposed uh, to getting hit by cosmic rays. So it's really sort of a, a very um, uh, cost. So we have this case, we have a, this, this data just came in, like just this week. Um, so we find that the 
the soil production here uh, was enough. Uh, to, it was covered in the last 10,000 years, but it's very likely they were visible and above ground when the Magdalenians came 17,000 years ago. So we're going to try to do a reconstruction of the landscape and what effect that might have had on the uh, placement and the structure um, uh, with a sandstone slab. So uh, that's been, been really fun. In fact, I was just on email with Bill in the middle of the night last night about this, right? So anyway, the other thing that we've got, which is pretty unusual, I mean, we have great lithics. We have a lot of lithics. They're very interesting, both local as well as exotic. Um, but, and maybe my colleague Sebastian and Kathy, they will come sometime in the spring and they can talk about lithics, right? That's great. I'm going to talk about pigments because we've got a lot of them um, and we've got um, some that are part of the sandstone that's degrading because the site was often in standing water. It's at the top of the hill, standing water, clearly just sitting there. It, there's no erosion. And if, you can, if Bill Dietrich says there's no erosion, there's no erosion. He is the most skeptical geomorphologist I've ever met. Everything is moving all the time. One day he even calculated how far the earthworms that we had, yes, we're in a woods, how far the earthworms were pushing artifacts around, right? So you know, Bill goes, May, that could have moved five inches, or that could have moved a foot in 17,000 years. The little earthworm just yeah, going along. Anyway, so what we have is this degrading sandstone that yields uh, coloring materials, but we also have a piece of quartzite that doesn't belong at the site, and it's clearly got embedded pieces of manganese in it. The, one of the more fun things is that we've got some, in this clay, we've got some very purple pigments, which are totally rare in Upper Paleolithic art. There are only four instances of purple, one of which is at a cave site called Marsoulis, 12 kilometers away, with which um, Père Blanc already has many similarities, uh, including the time, the lithic technology, and now this is all in purple, although I, you can't really see it here, I don't think. Yeah, right, Christine wants to see the purple. Right, yeah, this is purple, right. Right, this is purple, yeah. So, um, and then you can see some of our uh, different uh, samples. And, and so Philippe Walter came and did the analysis of the manganeses, uh, showing that he's from the University of Paris and uh, probably one of the major uh, pigment and coloring materials specialists in France. And he again showed that the black manganese at Marsoulis, this nearby site, and Père Blanc are very similar, whether they're coming from the same sources um, or not. So, it turns out that there are some pigment connections to be made, if it turns out this way. It will be one of the first examples to show a significant relationship between an open air site and a painted cave site. And of course, for us, this really is helpful for us to link sites in terms of a better understanding of the social geography. And one hypothesis is that the two sites are linked as an aggregation site, even if they're not in the same place, but in two different locations, they're nonetheless part of a system of activities and so forth. Uh, there is another uh, possible example of such a thing in the, in the general region. And that um, we also then are starting to think that given that it seems as if some of these uh, sa degrading sandstones are producing materials suitable for coloring, Maybe we can also think of Père Blanc as a provisioning place for pigments, that people were coming there. And we really need to get on it um, I, it's in my court with Joel uh, to start finding the sources uh, for, the, for the ochres. So Joel has been a godsend. Uh, she's a PhD student finishing up her work at NYU, working on some of the ordination pigments from the Dordogne uh, and the ways in which the ochres were being used not for coloring properties themselves, but as material to uh, abrade braid and rub on uh, shells and, and um, tools and uh, beads uh, to make them lustrous and to shine. So it's really polishing, using the ochre to polish and to make things lustrous, right? Which is really exciting. So we now have over 150 samples of pigments and she's doing a fantastic job of classifying them, uh, looking at them, getting the characterizations of them. We have manganeses, we have a mudstone, we have 
this uh, degrading sandstone, and we have uh, lots of hematite, and some of the hematite has um, striation marks in it showing that it, that it actually had, had been used. So thank you, Joel. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that, again, we get so excited about looking at colors and thinking it must be for quote-unquote art that actually there's lots of other uses for some of these minerals. Um, and as I say, uh, what she's found is the way in which um, uh, hematite is used for a lustrous finish. It's well known that ochre is used for tanning hides. That's really, you know, and so a lot of the pigments we get, and I'll show you a slide in a minute, on some of our stone tools may well be from the tools that were used to tan or process hide. Because they're very good for that. They're also, I found this in the literature, uh, they actually have photoprotective characteristics, the original SPF. Uh, and especially in some of the African sites, people are suggesting um, that the, that was uh, at work as a sunblock. We know it's useful as a glue. It's very well known for hafting. Um, and it's, uh, of course, sourcing is not easy, which is one reason why one of the papers at Tübingen was so exciting because they've actually been able to find some sources for the hematites and pigments they've been using there. But we have some ochre with mica in it, which really sparkles, and which is really great. And it's all concentrated in one little place within the structure. So somebody's got a sort of a, a hold on all of the uh, sparkly uh, hematite. Who knows who that was, right? So as you can see, uh, we were unexpected to find so many lithics with intentional ochre on them. So we've got uh, quite a, a few of them. Um, all of those are from the, the structure. Yeah, they're all in, in the structure, uh, all those units uh, there. So uh, that was one of the, the big and sort of fun surprises. So we've just got to keep looking at that. And it's, uh, it's about color, but it may not be about art. So anyway, great. Okay, so the invention of the wheel. Nico, did you give me this? I think you found this image for me. Human civilization was benefited by the invention of the color wheel, which helped cave paintings really pop. Anyway, uh, lots of acknowledgments to lots of people, lots of funding, many people here at ARF and elsewhere. Thank you, and I'll take questions. Question? Tim, good. Well, Meg, there's a million interesting things in there, but one thing you said, and it wasn't really a main point of your talk, but I wondered if you could comment on it, was some of the overlay of different engravings and art mm -hmm. in some of these caves, and you showed the top there, which mm -hmm. really brings to mind all the multiple layers of engravings all over right. here, which is right. hard to the modern eye because we're used to, or at least. Yes, I think. I'll you're supposed to that. color within the lines. You know, you don't. Color within the lines, and you're supposed to have one picture there and not 50 pictures on right. top of each other. And I just wonder if you could comment on that because it's well, I think, for us to see. Right. Well, I think people have, I mean, that's long been one of the characteristics of a lot of the uh, images of what we'll call cave art, uh, has been this sort of uh, accumulation. And you can actually, this, in some places now, like at Chauvet, They've done a very nice job of pulling it apart, what was there first, what was added next, to actually sort of you know, get the, the geological, the stratigraphic, if you will, approach to how the images were accumulated there, including at Chauvet, for example, where they even scraped off and made a fresh surface and then put more images on it. So I think, you know, of course, everybody says, well, what, what are you doing? You're ruining the images. But of course, it's probably not about the image as an image, as we think of it as an image. It's probably about place. It's probably about associations. What gets um, overmarked on top of what? Um, and the, the location in the cave. I mean, to me, that's one of the ways in which you know, people are remembering and making memory by you know, continuing to uh, put things on, on top of things. I think there's a lot, lot of uh, examples uh, of that, but it's, you know, I think it's, it's going to strain our notions, understandably, of what people think as, as should be art, and it also suggests that maybe the intentionality is not the image in and of itself, but the image interacting with other places and the, the cave wall. Yeah. Lisa? People propose that some of these superimposed drawings are really emotions. Like we see them today as static images, but right. 
maybe we're seeing them as we in Western society compared right. to the Western society right. are, and we're supposed to, or we could think of them as moving images, representing moving images, especially like the green candlelight. And right. Well, certainly when they have lots of legs and lots yeah, of, yeah. you know. And someone actually brought, a, a non-academic brought a study to my attention that I'll have to see if I can dig up for you that looked at modern children's pictures today, hmm. drawings, and where they haven't learned that art is supposed to be static. Right. And so that you know, kids will color, and they'll color over their drawings yeah. on, again and again. Right. And you know, it might be the same idea. They're, if you right. ask them what they're drawing, the study asked them what they were drawing, and they were drawing something that was moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's increasing work with um, things like scenes. Uh, an archaeologist in France, Marc Azema, has done a fantastic job about showing the movement that many of some of these kinds of things are actually not only scenes, but scenes of that he calls almost cinematic. Yeah, he's right. a YouTube Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was just going to add up to that, that the book of Solnit's book, The River of Light, discusses that changing Western conception of movement in mm -hmm. pictures. And at one point, she has a nice type of discussion about static images having multiple, have three multiple layers and becoming that movie picture that we get. Right, from. yeah. But actually, my question actually was about the, um, asking you to walk me through what makes ochre affixed to lithics. What, what, where's the intentionality in that? How would you read that? How does that happen? I think there is some stickiness inside hematite. I should have brought in, I have a little hematite sample uh, that actually enhances the possibility of the things to stick together. It's not as effective as something that was also used in the Upper Paleolithic, which is salmon, uh, the skin of salmon. There's a glue. If you take the skin off a salmon or a trout, you can scrape um, some goose stuff, and it works very well to, to half things, a, a salmon skin glue. Um, but the ochre, ha the hematites uh, often have sort of an oily uh, part to them that if you grind them and rub them together, you make a, like a little ball, almost not like as, as cohesive as clay, but you can make a little ball out of ground ochre, and it has this sort of sticky stuff in it. Uh, there's an article on, on how this is done. I can get, send you the reference. Yeah. yeah. So when you see it affixed to like that back microblade, it's being right. the microblade itself is being, okay. Right. Yeah, so the back blade could have been inserted into, you know, one of many uh, component parts. Uh, and the ochre could have helped, uh, although we do have resin. We have found quite a bit of resin in the site. Um, some of it on uh, some tools and then some just little pieces of sort of the sticky resiny, resiny stuff, which we're doing some chemical analysis on to find exactly what it is. But. Right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Technically, I can track how that works with changing the color of lipids right. to be able to red through some of the treatment. Right. So the pigments are colored. Yeah. No. Any other questions? Christine? Did you find any evidence of cooking or harms or light no. or no, we no. That we have some we have some burned stones in the structure, uh, and we have experimented with some of the stones on the site as to what would turn them that color, especially some big pieces of quartzite that were imported. And we find that they have to have been in the fire. They can't be adjacent to the fire. We had some little burnings going on down the pathway at one point to see under what conditions do these stones known from right the area um, sort of get burned. The problem with the site, we've had, we have lots of charcoal. It's all scattered. It's the standing water problem. The standing water has sort of dissolved and dissipated, dissipated it all. Right, we've submitted a number of samples. Uh, there are cases in the archaeological world of um, places where you have combustion features without um, a specific hearth or something like that. Um, and they, they exist and, you know, it may be, and we're doing micromorphology, so, you know, we get a lot of, of um, charcoal and carbon pieces, but we don't have anything that tells us. It doesn't us cluster at all, even though the water's been right. down, it doesn't tend to lie right. here in a little layer. Right, we keep trying. I mean, we brought Nico out with a magnetometer to try to find, you know, hot spots, and then we still actually have one that we haven't sort of done. So we do, we still have one more to go. 
We've done ground penetrating radar with Scott Byram. You know, we draw on all this local talent that we've got here. Next thing you know, we're going to bring Lisa out. <laughs> and um, anyway, so uh, yeah, no, it's been very frustrating. And the the way, main way in which we're attributing the site to a certain time period is, of course, on the one hand, on uh, typo technology of the artifacts, but on the other hand, we do have a series of um, OSL dates um, that give us you know, OSL being the optical simulation luminescence where you can date the time that a sand grain has been last exposed to the sun and we've done that. Um, the sand, it's nice because it is a sandy environment with all the sandstone breaking and crumbling and that does give us the 17,000 uh, date at one part of the site. So. Um, that's why we would, you know, we're drawing everything, cosmogenic analysis, you know, OSL, because it doesn't look, unless we find something, unless we find an eco spot, um, we, we're, we don't have a, a heart, right? Yeah, no, but we all have to deal with what we've got. The French can say, you know, OSL, we don't depend on to us OSL. You need, you need a carbon-14 date. We also did find a... Um, Underneath one of the stones, because we're starting to lift up the stones from the structure, we did find a piece of antler, uh, two pieces of antler uh, with a groove in it. Um, and we did said, send one piece, the, not the part with the groove, but we did send one piece uh, deaf or carbon date, and they couldn't, get any, they couldn't get anything out of it. Right. So we just have to hope that there's more. It's the second piece of um, antler we found. Uh, we have a really clear uh, basal part, part of a point, a beveled basal point, a really characteristic Magdalenian bone point, so um, a reindeer, out of reindeer. Um, so we, we get occasional organics, but um, I, and we're just hoping maybe the sandstone blocks are going to be better preservants than, than the, open, the completely open air stuff, right? Yeah, so, anyway, yeah. Anything else? Anything? Thank you. Well,